Well, good morning, church, wherever you're coming to us from. Um, we welcome you uh, here to Highlands Church this morning. And um, let's just go into God and praise this morning. He has done some great things for us throughout this time. Let's just all praise him this morning. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow our feet. He has done great things. See what the Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, O oh, God. You have done great things. We stand in your freedom, awake and alive. O oh, Jesus, our Savior. Your name lifted high, O oh God. You have done great things. Faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen, you will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh, God. You have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, you may lift in high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. You have done great things. God, we just come to you today with our worship, Father. We lift you up. We welcome you into our homes. We're just so thankful for today. We're thankful for all the things that you're doing in our lives through us, what you're doing through us for others, God. We lift you and all of our people and our communities up this morning, God. We come to you today. Come into our rooms and our houses. We worship you. Amen.
past seven years, every time we take the offering on Sunday, there have been colored eggs in the offering plates. I never knew who did it. I did find out last week, so TB, this is partly for you. But it's also a reminder, this first Sunday after Easter, we're still in the Easter season. Did you know that? That the celebration of Easter is actually a season of 50 days. And so we, through our ministry of giving, are able to make the resurrection of Jesus known every day because of your generosity. We are still the church. We are still proclaiming the risen Lord in many ways. So may God bless the giving of our church, our church family, that we may continue to do his work. you're doing for us, God. 
we just ask that you come to our homes this morning. Wherever we're at, any time of day, God, we know that you're going to be here for us. We just ask that you just continue to bless us throughout the week, God. May you open up our hearts and our minds this morning, Father. May we hear your voice. May you not only be the God of our hearts, but be the God of our lips today and all days. And in your name we pray. Amen. It is still Easter. Again, we're in the season of Easter. This is the second Sunday of Easter. And I want to read to you a story from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, that reminds us of what it was like for the disciples following the resurrection. So I'll begin with the 24th verse. Now Thomas, also known as the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came to them. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet still believe. There's a story told of a Persian general. And when he captured those who were spies, they would be, of course, sentenced to death. But this Persian general had an unusual custom. He would give condemned criminals the choice between the firing squad or in that same room where that was to take place, there was a big black door. And he would give them the choice of the firing squad or the big black door. A spy was caught, and indeed, he was given that very same choice. He thought about it, but shots rang out a little while later, confirming his decision. The general said to his assistant, isn't that something? They always prefer the known to the unknown. It's so characteristic of people to be afraid of the undefined, yet I still gave him a choice. Well, what is beyond that big black door, asked the assistant. And the general said, freedom. Freedom. Yet over the years, very few have been brave enough to take it. That story reminds us, albeit rather graphically, of how difficult it can be to make a leap of faith, to take a risk. There is always a temptation to stay with the familiar, to believe in only what you can see. Thomas had a similar dilemma. Jesus predicted his passion but he also predicted his resurrection. The disciples were together and they saw Jesus. Thomas wasn't there. They tell him, but he refuses to believe. He wanted to see Jesus for himself, which is quite, of, uh, quite interesting in and of itself, isn't it? I mean, he'd spent so much time with these men. These were close friends. He knew he could trust them. I don't know why he doesn't, but he says he must see Jesus for himself. He had to be sure that Jesus really was raised from the dead. But let's not be misled into thinking that Thomas was a weak disciple. I know we like to call him the doubter. Earlier in John's gospel, Thomas is portrayed as one being fiercely loyal. One could even say recklessly zealous. Do you remember? It was after the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and Jesus says, let us go to Judea. And the other disciples say, and this is a paraphrased version, Jesus, are you crazy? They want to kill you. We don't want to go to Judea. You don't need to go to Judea. But it's Thomas. It's Thomas who says, let us go and die with him. Thomas was an active, vital 
part of Jesus' ministry, which of course was marked by signs and wonders, but the whole thing changed. After the resurrection, faith takes on a whole new dimension. So let's not be too hard on old Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas, but that's really based only on one account of his experience with Jesus. Did the other disciples believe Mary when she told them that Jesus was raised from the dead? No. And perhaps this is one of the greatest difficulties that we have as believers in sharing our faith. From the very beginning, when we try to tell the Christian story to others, way before we get to the part about Jesus being raised from the dead, it is full of the miraculous. It's almost too much for some to swallow. It is too much for some to swallow. I think one of the great architects of our nation, Thomas Jefferson, everyone knows about the Jeffersonian Bible and how he edited his own version of the Gospels. And he removed all of the passages that dealt with the miraculous. And that, of course, includes the resurrection. That edited version of the Bible he called the life and morals of Jesus. He loved the idea of Jesus as a person being a great role model, but he couldn't buy into the miraculous. And from time to time, we in the church, much like the original disciples, more than just Thomas, have a faith crisis. We want to see. If only we could see, then we could believe. But we've got to see so we can be sure. But listen, some things have to be believed in order to be seen. Jesus' words to Thomas echo through the centuries. Do not be unbelieving. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Perhaps these words resonate so well for us because so many have been or are unbelieving. For centuries, intelligent and respective people, respected people have thought believing in God is a foolish notion. The 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, God is dead. And you'll remember that whole idea was somewhat revived in academics in the 1960s. Sigmund Freud believed and taught that the very idea of God is merely a father-like substitute that we need as adults, much as we needed that father as a child. The French philosopher John Paul Sartre said, we can't even deal with the question of God because we have so much to deal with about our own identities, our own morality. Even today, many people who are in the spotlight tell us that they are a person of no faith whatsoever. And there are some Brilliant minds, I would say, some great thinkers, good writers, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris. They're all atheists, but they do ask some good questions about life and morality. And these men that I've just mentioned, they will assert that we're just too smart now in the 21st century to have any kind of belief in any higher power or a God, much less the God of the Bible. And you have friends that say that too, right? And this much is true. We are a brilliant people. There is much we still don't know, but there is so much that we do know. When I was in school in the 90s, encyclopedias had a shelf life of three years. Ask your child or grandchild what an encyclopedia is. They don't know what those are because they don't print them anymore. And if we did, they would have to be changed and altered weekly because we're constantly making new discoveries. The Hubble telescope, you've seen the pictures that it's brought back to us, not only of the earth, but of the universe. And some of the theories that we've had about the universe have changed because of those photographs. New hypotheses have been given because of them. I could go on and on. Indeed, we are, shall we say, children of the Enlightenment. We need and sometimes demand empirical proof, hard data to believe something. I mean, even in the 1950s, we knew that smoking 
couldn't be healthy for a person, even though a decade earlier, more doctors recommend Camel than any other cigarette. That was a popular commercial. It wasn't until 1992 that we knew for a fact that smoking caused cancer. And there were a lot of people who would say before then, I'll quit if it's proven that it causes cancer. You see, my point is, most often, we don't act until we know. Yet at the same time, if I go to the doctor and he tells me that I have a blockage, I will entrust my life to a man I've never met to cut open my chest to increase the blood flow to and from my heart. Boy, that takes faith, doesn't it? Different kind of faith, but still trust, risk. And may I declare to you that the evidence we might seek of God and God being at work in the lives of people in our world is all around us. There are those who endure all, all kinds of hardship and grief and chronic illness, so many that suffer various kinds of tragedy that no person should ever have to endure, but they're able to continue moving forward in life because of faith. Because of faith, God's grace and power, they find the courage and strength to cope and move forward in faith. How many schools and orphanages and homeless shelters, opportunities for hungry people to be fed. I, I could go on, the countless institutions and programs and people and organizations that have been established by people of faith. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, all I have seen teaches me to trust the Creator for all that I have not seen. Emerson was right, and it's a perpetual thing. As we continue to see, we're given all the more reason to trust what is unseen, that which is yet to come. But this, again, is the very definition of faith, trust in the unseen. It needs no proof, no empirical evidence. And having said that, I must point out in our gospel lesson, Jesus does, does meet Thomas's demand for proof, Thomas wants to see the nail prints. He wants to see the scar, and Jesus does show him the scars. In fact, he encourages Thomas to touch his side, though the gospel doesn't tell us whether he did or not. And it's staggering to me, and I know at first all of us want to scold Thomas and label him as a doubter, and yet isn't it interesting? Jesus isn't angry with him that he's slow to come to the Easter faith. What matters is that Thomas be given a chance to believe. What is of ultimate concern is that he might share in and be transformed by the Easter message. So it is with us. Yes, some things must first be believed in order to be seen. His name was Cecil. He was in his mid-70s, a retired chemical engineer. He was a brilliant man. He taught an adult Sunday school class. And each week, he would walk into the church library where he taught that class, carrying a satchel filled with books and papers, commentaries and the like. He never socialized with others with coffee or donuts. He always went straight to his class, which appropriately met in the church library. He would march straight into the library with his satchel of books, and at the hour Sunday school was to begin, he would close the door. He took that role as Sunday school teacher so very seriously. It was a large church, but that class only had an, uh, a group of about a dozen or so, I suppose because he gave them homework. They started on time every week and usually stayed late and then had their homework. Cecil liked to tell people that Although he had taught his class for several decades, he'd only been a Christian for a few years. He would give his testimony, I was a Christian here, but not here. He grew up in church. He raised his kids in church. He thought it was important for people to have good, sound knowledge of the Bible. So he started to teach a class. Years went by, and then as, as he was preparing to teach a lesson on the resurrection one Easter, he began asking himself some hard yet honest questions. So Cecil made an appointment to see the pastor. He was already a member 
of the church, but he asked, how much do you have to believe to be a member of this church? Because I don't believe very much. I'm a man of reason, a man of science. I have a lot of doubts about Christianity. The pastor asked Cecil to explain, and he told him that he had problems with Christ's deity, with the miracles, and of course, the resurrection. They talked for a while, and then the pastor gave him some C.S. Lewis books, I think, and said, come back in a few weeks. After you read these books, come back, and we'll talk some more. Well, a year or so passed. Cecil and the pastor never had their follow-up conversation, but one day Cecil did go to see him, and he told his pastor, I had a dream. I had a dream that was so real. I was walking down a huge, long corridor, carrying my satchel filled with all of my books and study notes, and at the end of the hallway, I came to a door. Through that door, I could see the most beautiful room I'd ever seen, and inside, there were all these people laughing and talking and enjoying one another. The room was flooded with the most gorgeous light. And inside that room was everything I wanted in life. And so I tried to enter the room, but my satchel was too big to fit through the doorway. I tried to turn sideways, but again, my satchel kept me from getting through the door. The things I had in there were just too bulky. My satchel was too big. And then he said, I realized that my satchel contained all my doubts, all my doubts about God and faith, and that inside the doorway was the life that God was offering me. My questions and my doubts were just too big. They were holding me back. But then he said, I heard a voice say, Cecil, sit that satchel down and leave it by the door. And Cecil said, that's exactly what I did. I set down my satchel, stepped through the door, and today I'm living inside that room. Friends, evidence will only take us so far. And then we have to take a step of faith. So have you taken that step? Are you a Christian not merely here, but also here? Faith is the ability to trust what we cannot see. And I dare say a life empowered with faith will free us from the stifling enclosures of life that would otherwise entrap us. Some things have to be believed in in order to be seen. Come through the door of faith and declare with Thomas, my Lord and my God. And as a way of publicly affirming your faith, I want to invite you, wherever you are on social media, whatever platform you use, and if multiple platforms, just put the hashtag, I believe in Easter. As a part, as a part of your witness, hashtag, I believe in Easter. Thanks be to God.